All right, so just to review for you or remind you that the respiratory system spans two chapters, we're clearly not going to get into everything, but a lot of the information is, I don't want to say redundant, but kind of repeating again some concepts that we learned early in the semester, so we'll be able to be a bit more concise. So we're going to start out with uh, chapter 16. Uh, our objectives include uh, looking at uh, internal and external respiration which we covered in, uh, well, we didn't cover it, but we talked about the external respiration in the lab, the inspiration and expiration. So we'll review that fairly quickly. We're going to review as well the structure and function of the conducting versus respiratory zones. Also, right, previously addressed, looking at um, your handout that you turned in last week. Then we're going to review the role of surfactant in the lungs, also introduced in lab uh, a week or two ago. Then we'll look again the phases of ventilation, breathing in and out, and then uh, correlate pressure and resistance to the flow of air. So the concepts will be very similar to the flow of blood like we saw in our vessels, as we'll see here in the, um, the respiratory system. So those are the major objectives. So what are we still going to talk about? The gradient. We're still going to have to uh, establish pressure gradients to move our gases. So that'll be a theme that we'll continue to see uh, here. We're also going to intertwine the circulatory system with the respiratory system because they're so interrelated. So there will certainly be overlap there, but we can't really understand the respiratory system until we have a, this appreciation of the circulatory system. If we were to just kind of simplify the function of the respiratory system, uh, the first phase is called external respiration. And then uh, where we're basically getting air from the atmosphere into your blood, and the internal respiration will occur uh, when there's exchange between the systemic capillaries and your body tissues. So internal is when we see that systemic circuit exchange happening. We're going to elaborate as well the external respiration with ventilation which is just physically bringing air in and out of the lungs. So we'll review uh, the phases of inspiration, expiration. So to get the air in and out of the lungs. And then we'll also have to address the transport of the gases in the circulatory system. So once, once gases are in the blood, we've got to acknowledge their solubility and binding to hemoglobin or conversion, et cetera. And then once they're the gases are transported in the, in the circulatory system, then we can right, internally respire, and then within a cell, it respires. So that cellular respiration is tied back to chapter three, where oxygen is used at the mitochondria, and carbon dioxide is produced right, and is sent across the systemic capillaries. Any questions yet? We're going to look at the basic anatomy, reviewing from your handout. We identified uh, there are two primary zones of the respiratory system itself, the conducting zone. Uh, what is the job of the conducting zone? What's the function of the conducting zone? Of these structures, the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, etc. Okay, just the name implies right, is the conduct air, right, from the nose and larynx, right, down towards the what? Uh, well, what part though? Where do we want to get the air to? We want to get the air to the the bronch, and we want to get it specifically down to the respiratory zone. The conducting zone just transfers air down to the system, what does the respiratory zone do? That's where the gas exchange actually happens. So the respiratory zone has a gas exchange with the pulmonary capillaries. So oxygen unloading out of the alveoli and the carbon dioxide loading into the alveoli. The respiratory zone Describe it starting it with uh, your terminal or the end bronchioles uh, through the individual alveoli. 
intentional airflow sac. Everything else just conducts. So the trachea, the main stem, bronchi, they won't do any exchange with the pulmonary circuit. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, question? Does the respiratory zone start from the bronchioles? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the terminal bronchioles, the very end ones. There may be some uh, exchange there. However, the bulk of the exchange does occur in the alveoli. But you wouldn't find it in uh, some of these larger, like uh, secondary kind of structures. So the very tiny uh, alveoli. Uh, excuse me, bronchioles, the very end, there may be some pulmonary capillaries that we can see some uh, exchange of. Okay. Additional questions? One thing we should note about the respiratory system, if we kind of look at the, at the airways a little closer and looking at the lumen diameter, the diameter of the structures actually decreases the more deep we get into the lung tissue. And we can correlate the same type of um, connections about diameter and resistance and flow like we did in the blood vessels. So the dia where's the diameter the greatest in our respiratory system? The larynx, the larynx right? So the very kind of the, in right, the back of the mouth, right? So the resistance would be the least. And then remember... So go back, think of the capillaries, right? We had our arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, right? Remember the exchange happens at the capillaries? And so even though the capillaries have the least right, lumen diameter, the most dramatic change happened where? The most dramatic change in lumen diameter happened where? Happens where? At the arterioles. So in our circulatory system, blood enters real fast, but then we hit the arterioles and diameter drops, resistance goes up, so flow and etc. drops significantly. So that by the time blood gets to the capillaries, the flow is nice and steady. You have a similar type of thing happening in the, in the respiratory system, where air enters low resistance, and then we have at the very end something that we need to exchange where the, the diameter is the least. However, upstream, there's right, a big drop in the diameter. So you can see where it says just smaller bronchi. So we went from 8 to 10 all the way down to maybe 1. We just plummet in the diameter. So the resistance would be greatest where? In the respiratory system. The smaller bronchi is where we're going to tra see that transition. You know, the increase in resistance happens at the smaller bronchi, so that when it gets to the terminal bronchioles and the alveoli, the airflow is what? Steady. Low resistance, steady, constant. Because we don't want to do what with these alveoli? We don't want to what? We don't want to damage them. We want to have a punctured lung just for the sake of getting the air in. So we want to slow down the velocity, the flow of air, before it gets to the end. We want to let it in and then slow it down and then let it do its thing in the alveoli. So our greatest source of resistance in the respiratory system is kind of in the middle at the smaller uh, bronchi or the bronchioles. Does that make sense? Some terms, I think we've used these terms but I can't remember for sure. Air will enter the conducting zone as a turbulent. We used that word before. Do you experience any turbulence? Turbulence, right? What does that mean? Kind of erratic, right? So airflow is kind of tumbling. Well, that's not an airflow, but you know, so it's like tumbling. So the air enters the respiratory system very turbulent. By the time it uh, exits the smaller bronchi, the airflow is, is it turbulent? It needs to be steady or constant. If you look at airflow, you would use the word laminar. So it's nice and steady. By the time it gets down to the alveoli, it's less likely to damage.
You okay on the difference between turbulent versus laminar? Yes. Uh, enter the respiratory system turbulent. So I take a big deep breath in, air is all tumbly. And then it transitions from turbulent to laminar between the smaller bronchi and the bronchiole. So your system just squeezing down on that turbulence and it enters, it, it exits those things and enters the alveoli and is steady, nice and steady. Does that answer your question? Additional questions? Okay, if we zoom in and look at a single alveolus, also repeated from your handout that you turned in last week, there's some uh, unique cells here. The first include the type 1 alveolar cell. Uh, what is the job of the type 1 cell? They form a barrier. They also they do the respiratory part. They do the respiratory part. They do the diffusion of the gases, right? This is where our type 1 cells do um, make up the structure of the alveolus, but they also do the exchange, gas exchange, with the pulmonary surface. Our type 1 cells are colored yellow here. Are they colored yellow in your body? No. All right. Uh, the type 2 cells are shown in the green things. What is the job of the type 2 cell? They also line the alveolus, but their main job uh, is to secrete pulmonary surfactant, okay, whose job is to do what? Reduce surface tension, to prevent collapse. Your pulmonary, pulmonary surfactant comes from the type 2 alveolar cells. Also in the alveolus, you'll find macrophages. Macrophages are types of what? White blood cells, immune cells. And so the macrophages aren't giving structure to the alveolus. They're just giving immunity function. And so we can kind of see it, uh, a white blood cell moving about. So they're not stationary here like maybe this image implies. Does that make sense? They're not the alveolus, but they're kind of going around, right? Just check it out. So you would have a, a, an adequate number of white blood cells just waiting in your alveolus, because every breath you take, you're taking in foreign particles, and you're, they're getting rid of these before you succumb to dust particles, right? Or whatever the case may be. They're, they're busy little cells. Also characteristic of your uh, alveoli are your, and let's clarify, this is our pulmonary capillaries surrounding our uh, alveoli to allow for exchange, gas exchange. And then uh, we also have pores in the alveoli. If you had a bag, you may call them pores or cones. What is the job of the pores? Allow, you said equilibrium of gas, gas pressure. So keep the gas pressure equal throughout the alveolus. So you don't have one little part really high pressure, low pressure. If they're not equal, we're going to mess with the gradient. And so uh, you may have a hard time getting air in or out of the lungs if they're all just at their own little pressure. There wouldn't be a good gradient. And so we can equilibrate the pressure between the little alveoli by the presence of these pores. So they're, just, they're like doors, if you will, from one alveolus to another. What I want to do is conclude today looking at figure 16.5, zooming in, the relationship between uh, a type 1 cell and a pulmonary capillary cell. So over here we have uh, the alveoli lumen, and then over on the far right hand side we have the um, blood plasma. And the point, or what's referred to as a respiratory membrane, is, and I've got a wrong uh, measurement here, uh, it is very tiny, right? two tenths of a millimeter. So it's very thin, so we can increase what? Diffusion. So we want to decrease the distance that the gas has to diffuse across so we can enhance the diffusion. We, just want, we don't want to hold the gases up any more than necessary. So that thin membrane is there to enhance the diffusion of our gases. And I'm actually lied to a little bit. I'm going to conclude with the inspiration and expiration. It should be a review from our lab. So let's, uh, let's go through this real quick. Uh, looking at the phases of inspiration. During inspiration, what happens? 
Diaphragm contracts, moves towards the abdominal cavity. What else contracts? Intercostals contract to cause the rib cage to expand and elevate. I've effectively increased the volume, which thanks to Boyle's law, tells me the air pressure will decrease so that during inspiration, air would move into the lungs, down it, such as it is. By contrast, during expiration, the diaphragm will relax, as will the intercostals, which cause the rib cage to depress. So I effectively have, then what was my volume? Decreased it. Squeezing all that new volume of air causes the pressure to go up higher than atmospheric pressure, so air would move out of the lungs down its pressure gradient. Over the evening, I need you to review those partial pressure gradients that exist for oxygen and carbon dioxide and how the gases are transported. So that will be found in chapter 17. Review chapter 17 in the phases of urine formation. We'll conclude our last day of class on Thursday.